Hi there! It's the end of another month, which means it's also time to round up what we read. I had an absolutely amazing reading month in February, and I made my way through fantasy, through science fiction, and through some dystopian books. And today, you're going to hear all about it. Welcome aboard the International Express to Book Central. Grab a seat, settle in, and let's while away the journey with some book chat. I'm your host, Jules, and like I said, I had an amazing reading month. I've not necessarily been dealing with a reading slump, but the last few months I mainly just felt like I didn't have the time to really read a book. And that meant that my reading lists were getting longer and longer with me adding books to it but never really taking any away. But this month, by which I mean February, changed the game. I took some days off, the semester ended, and suddenly I just found myself devouring one book after the other. It does mean I'm currently taking a bit more of a break again. My brain is like, okay, we have too many stories in it. But it means I've got some super exciting books to share with you, some classics, some books that are still kind of taking over book talk or cause discourse. So I'm excited to get into it with you. So why not get started? The first book I read, or well, technically the first book I finished in February, is one I actually started in Jan, and that is 381 by Aaliyah Whiteley. Now, I've been a big fan of Aaliyah Whiteley's writing pretty much since, I think, 2016, when I read my first novella by her, and I love the way that she used speculative fiction, horror, sci-fi, to kind of tell stories about bigger themes. So the novella I read in 2016 was The Beauty, which was about a world in which women maybe didn't exist anymore, and then there's a weird fungus, which that's growing out of graves, and... It was fascinating, and it was actually very insightful about gender roles. So since then, I've been on the Leah Whiteley train. So naturally, when I saw that she had a new book coming out, 381, I decided to read it. And I loved it, actually. <laughs> that sounds hesitant, because I had to think about it for a second. But 381 is, in a way, a little complicated, because it tells two different stories. So the main kind of storyline is set in 2314, so like three centuries almost into the future. And there we meet a woman called Rowena. And she is something of a curator. When the story starts out, she's still quite young. But she lives in this future where humanity has basically managed to get rid of most conflict, in part by consciousness sharing and by people kind of existing past their body limit and then being given a body. Anyway, it's very interesting the way that this future is set up. But when we meet Rowena, she is still kind of a teenager physically, even though her mind, her consciousness has been alive for longer. And she's now trying to figure out, now that I have a body, what do I do? And she's diving into the archive that still exists of 21st century internet things. So the 21st century in the book is called The Age of Riches. And there is so much content available still from our time in 2314 when Rowena lives and one of the things she encounters online which really just grab her attention is a story called The Dance of the Horned Road. This is a narrative that she finds online perhaps almost like a blog post or a published book or almost like a folk tale and it tells the story of Fairly who walks the horned road which is a quest that all young people in Fairley's village get to undertake if they feel called to it. And it basically means they have to leave their village, they get certain provisions, and then they just have to walk the road. And along certain points on the road, they'll find certain buttons that they need to press, and they are warned that they will be followed by someone called the Breathing Man. And Fairley isn't entirely sure why she's on this quest, what she's doing on the road, Meanwhile, Rowena is reading this story three centuries later. So we get this kind of back and forth between the narratives, and the way it's done is that Rowena basically tells us at the beginning, I'm still unsure where I want to take my own life, so I'm going to annotate this document that I found, and maybe as I reread it and as I annotate it, I'll figure out what I want to do with my life. 
So as we then start Fairley's story, her quest, we get footnotes to uh, Rowena's comments where she'll say, well, this was a very weird thing that apparently they did in the 21st century, or what does this mean? Is this a literary motif or is this just a random detail? And her commentary kind of changes as she grows up, as she develops. And I really like this back and forth. I'm not going to tell you any more about where Fairley's quest goes or what Rowena decides to do, but the back and forth between these two storylines was something I really liked. I did see reviews after I'd read it that said that the footnotes, especially in a digital version, were a bit confusing or didn't work well. And I can't see that. For me, on my Kindle, it wasn't a problem. And I like footnotes. <laughs> so I, I like the way that the story is interwove, to put it that way. It isn't entirely clear where the title may be necessarily what it refers to specifically. One thing I'll tell you still about that text that Rowena finds, The Dance of the Horned Road, is that every entry or every chapter is exactly 381 words. And Rowena kind of comments on this and thinks about it like, what does it mean? 381 has different meanings that Rowena plays with. And really, the entire book is a search for meaning. What it means to be human, what it means to have a life. And I really enjoyed that. I also, in my review for this book, I wrote about how it reminded me of working with medieval texts, where you'll find a text that's centuries old, a lot of the social context that might have been relevant is no longer available to you. So you kind of have to, well, conjecture, guess, kind of like I showed you in the episode on Wolf and Eadwacker, that old English poem, right? You just have to go for it and try and figure it out. But yeah. I really liked 381. It is a calm novel. Even though a lot does happen, the, the tone is quite calm, the way Fairley tells us about her adventure and the way Rowena then comments on it. But there is a lot there if you dig into it. Like I said, I, I really like this novel. I continue to really like everything Aaliyah Whiteley writes. This one is a bit of a departure because it doesn't feel quite as sci-fi or speculative. It feels a bit more fantastic, but also a bit more restrained. I would fully recommend it if you're willing to kind of dive into a story that will leave you with unanswered questions because it's the questions you need to answer for yourself. I love a good book that asks me what I think I'm going to do with my life <laughs> because it makes me go, I don't know, but it gives me a chance to think about it. And then I decided it was finally time to get back into a duology, trilogy, series that I'd started years back. And that is the Alex Stern series, trilogy, duology by Lee Bardugo. And I decided to read Ninth House first and then get a copy of Hellbent, the second book, later in the month. So I reread Ninth House and I liked it almost more, I think, than the first time I read it. So Ninth House is, I would say, an adult fantasy. It is about Alex, or Galaxy Stern, and she has just been allowed into Yale on a scholarship because there are secret societies in Yale that work with magic, and she happens to be able to see greys or ghosts. And that's a very important part of a specific group's responsibilities within Yale, who are meant to kind of oversee the rituals that take place and make sure nothing goes wrong. So she's offered a full scholarship to go to this fancy university, and there has to be a catch, right? <laughs> what I really liked about Ninth House is the way in which it takes the difficulty that would be seeing ghosts very seriously. So. Alex has seen ghosts pretty much since she can remember, and she's had some quite negative experiences with that as well, especially because no one could help her with it, and she realized this is something I need to keep quiet. And there is trauma there, there is difficulty there, and rather than say, hey, she's our chosen one and she's always excelled, Lee Bardugo is quite honestly shows how, how traumatic it can be and how difficult and how you have to deal with it in whatever way possible and how that can also lead you down wrong paths. So Alex has quite a traumatic past, which is why this is definitely an adult book. There is physical violence, sexual violence, drug use, etc. But I do think Lee Bardugo deals with it in a way where she doesn't shy away from it, 
but it's also not meant to exploit the characters. But it is meant to hit you as a reader. I do think you're meant to be like, Jesus, <laughs> poor Alex. <laughs> um, and to kind of gain some understanding of her character through having those experiences shared with you. What I also really liked about Ninth House is just the world that Lee Bardugo sets up. So if I remember correctly, she herself also went to Yale and did, I think, a postgraduate or a graduate degree there. And the way she describes Yale, where I've never been, I feel like I could I could walk down its streets. <laughs> she describes their buildings and the structure of the campus and New Haven all around it. She describes it so well. And she also pays attention to that kind of difference that people feel between the university and the town, right? That kind of idea of like, oh, we are Yale and the people around us are plebs. That struggle is represented in a really interesting way, I think, in the book. And it's something that Alex, who is such an outsider to a kind of prestigious university, but also a kind of secret society that takes itself very seriously, she has a very interesting position in that. On top of that, the kind of fantasy elements I really liked. I thought it was explained quite well what the different societies do and what Alex's role is in that and and the kind of conflicts between the groups, etc. So that was really interesting. One thing that is a bit tricky about Ninth House is that it jumps around timeline-wise quite a bit. You kind of start near the end and then you jump back all the way to the beginning, then you jump about halfway, then you get another chapter from what happens at the end. And it is like marked clearly in the book, but you have to give yourself a second to be like, oh, okay, so this is spring. That is what happened in winter. She would have started in autumn at a university. So, okay. It requires a little bit of mental arithmetic, but I like that. I like getting little hints of like, oh no, everything's gone wrong. Let's see how we got there. But it can also be a bit confusing. However, I loved rereading this book and I also just started Hellbent and I'm very much enjoying that and let me actually check while I've got you here <laughs> if this is a trilogy or a duology oh okay so there is an untitled book <laughs> coming up the third book <laughs> according to Storygraph so I'll have that to look forward to so that was Ninth House after diving into sci-fi and magic and fantasy I decided I wanted to read something a little bit more grounded and I realized I had a copy of The Mad Women's Ball by Victoria Moss, translated by Frank Wynne, still flying around on my Kindle. This was a book that came out in 2019 and I'd been looking forward to it since then. It's originally French, so it was translated into English by Frank Wynne and I think it was also turned into a TV show or a film by Amazon not too long ago. In short, the Mad Women's Ball takes place in Paris towards the end of the 19th century, so around 1885, and it's mainly set at the Salpetriere Asylum. This is a historic place, so this novel is definitely historical fiction. The novel follows three different women, so we kind of get three different storylines that then intersect. The first, and I think the one that we're also meant to connect with most as an audience, is Eugenie. She is a young woman, daughter of a well-to-do family, um, and she has a secret. <laughs> her dad basically wants her to be a good, quiet, passive little woman, and she herself can see ghosts. Do you see the link to Ninth House here? <laughs> she can see ghosts, but she also is a bit of a feminist. She wants to do much more with her life. She wants to be able to give her own opinions, and she's kind of dealing with, okay, how do I find a way out of the restrictions that are placed upon me? However, at a certain point, she reveals to her grandmother that she can see ghosts. And as a consequence of this, she gets whisked off to the Salpetier Asylum. The choice there is basically, is she lying? And is she therefore insane? Because who would lie about seeing ghosts? This is according to her father, right? Or she can actually see ghosts, and in that case, she's basically satanic and also does not belong in our proper fancy family. So that is the first storyline that we get. And then we also have scenes narrated from the perspective of Genevieve, who is a nurse at the asylum, has been for decades, and she believes very strongly in science and in medicine and in the Dr. Charcot who works at the asylum. Her story is a bit of an awakening where she realizes, okay, maybe there's more than the science that I've been reading, um, and maybe there's more outside the bounds of this asylum as well. 
And then the third storyline follows Louise, who is a patient at the asylum from the start, and she occasionally takes part in Dr. Charcot's lectures. And I will tell you more about those in a second. But through those three different storylines, we kind of get a sense of the role of women in late 19th century Paris, the restrictions met by the freedoms, and also the way in which mental health or rather mental illnesses were treated. Now, an important thing here is that because it is historical fiction, it is based on real characters and on actual history. And this is where some of my issues with the novel came in. On the one hand, The Mad Women's Ball is a pleasant read. It has this fairy tale like quality, at least it did to me. And because of that, I kind of breeze through it, right? And Victoria Miles kind of lays out a lot of things for you where if a character does something, she'll immediately explain to you why. If she doesn't do something, Miles will immediately explain to you why. So you don't have to do a whole lot of guessing or diving into things. Mars will explain it straight away. But my one issue is that because of that explanation and that fairy tale like quality, I feel like it misses some nuance. The Salpetriere Asylum under Dr. Charcot in the late 19th century was a very important place. So Dr. Charcot was a bit of a pioneer in the field of neurology, as far as I understand. He worked on things like Parkinson's disease. And he was also a man who hypnotized his female patients in front of crowds. Um, admittedly invited crowds, but still he hypnotized them in order to display symptoms of their hysteria, which feels very exploitative, and that is definitely an aspect of it. On the other hand, he used this research and the attention he brought to hysteria to kind of countermand the fact that some people claimed it was just a female issue, etc. And he, he really tried to show certain medical things that were going on to remove some of the stigma associated with hysteria, so he's a complicated figure. On the one hand, yes, some of the things that he did, I would say, admittedly from my 21st century perspective, were exploitative and maybe a bit misogynist as well. On the other hand, his research was very valuable and it also benefited female patients to a certain extent. So I think considering the nuance there, I don't know if his time at the Salpetriere Asylum was the best place to to write a book which lacks nuance <laughs> when it comes to, to gender issues, power imbalances, etc. I guess I had just hoped that The Mad Women's Ball would be a bit more hot-hitting. So it was a pleasant read, it went quickly, but um, I have better recommendations <laughs> when it comes to reading novels, but also actual non-fiction books about mental illness and gender. I can pop those into a comment. So yeah, that was the Mad Women's Ball. Not super hyped about it, but fine. After a slightly disappointing read, I then decided to dive into something absolutely insane. <laughs> and that is YN, or Your Name, by Esther Yi. I, uh, how, how do I explain or summarize what this novel is about? Um, so... Your Name is about uh, a woman who is not a big fan of boy bands, of pop culture, of anything that feels superficial. She's clearly the kind of person who's read some self-help books, but also philosophy books, and kind of really imbibed the idea of, no, I need to push forward to true meaning and stuff like that. So she's a bit annoying, but within the first chapter, her housemate is like, I've got extra tickets to go see this Korean boy band you're coming with me because my friend can no longer come and it'll be great. And Arnaretta doesn't want to go, but she does. And at this concert, she sees this boy band, she has something of a religious experience and kind of falls head over heels in love, but it's it's like not entirely love with one of the singers, one of the boys, and his name is Moon. And she basically becomes obsessed with this man and because she herself, she lives in Germany and she's half Korean, half American, I believe. And this is a Korean boy band. And eventually she starts writing YN fan fiction. So YN is your name. So it's basically reader insert fan fiction. And it is, then she goes to Korea to find him. This novel 
is is hilarious. <laughs> there are moments where I laughed out loud, and there were also moments where I was like, what is going on? Because it's also utterly absurd, quite abstract. The writing is is fascinating because it's not meant to be straightforward. So this sounds like it could be a straightforward maybe romance novel, right? But it's not. It's it's a novel about um, parasocial relationships, about about how your own personality becomes dependent on others, how fragile reality is. And it's not an easy book to read, especially I would say the last third gets quite fantastical and not in the sense of, oh, dragons, etc., but more as in these situations could be real, but they feel like they're heightened to such an extent that, that weird things are happening. So Esther Yi wrote a fascinating book. I'm looking forward to reading more by her, but I know it will take me some time to get through because although Wayana is a short book, it's about 200 pages or so, it took me a couple of evenings to get through just because the writing is very dense, there are a lot of things that are suggested and then just left to kind of float in the air. And and in the end, the basic plot is so upset. <laughs> So yeah, I I really liked YN. I would definitely recommend it if you are into philosophical yet abstract novels. It has something Kafka-esque, I would almost say, just with how convoluted some of the things get and how that convolutedness kind of shows how absurd modern life is. So yeah, I think I have to leave it at that because I don't know how else to explain <laughs> what this book is about, but I would recommend it if you're up for a mind trip. This was the point in the month, which we've reached now, where I took some days off and <laughs> I was able to fully dive into a book I'd been saving for quite a while, and that is A Memory Called Empire by Arcady Martin. This is a science fiction book which had been on my list for years. It came out in 2019 as well, and basically since then I've, I've been trying to read it. So A Memory Called Empire is about an ambassador called Mahid, and she comes from uh, this kind of station which floats in space, so she's unplaneted. And her system or her station basically sends an ambassador to the center of the empire, which is the Texcalanli Empire. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, but there you go. And the emperor has called for a new ambassador. So clearly something has happened to the old ambassador. Mahit has no idea why or what has happened to him, but she's been training her entire life for something like this, which is why she's chosen. She's in love with the empire's literature and with its culture and poetry. So she's very much torn between, between the empire and her own station, which is not yet part of the empire. So there's something of an independent struggle going on there. Her station wants Mahi to make sure that it does not get submerged in the empire, but the emperor might have his own ideas about that. Mahit gets sent to Taiskalanli, to the empire, to the main city, and she has to figure out what is going on. There's all kinds of intrigue and political dealings, and there are potential uprisings. Things are never as they seem. And she has to figure out who she can trust as a completely new person, as a complete stranger in the center of the empire. What I really liked about this book is the way Arcady Martin builds up the empire and the station and how she addresses imperialism, colonialism, and especially the effect on culture as well. That's kind of something I got out of it, the way in which an empire, even from a distance, can impose its its cultural cachet on other societies. So the fact that its literature and its poetry are praised and shared widely and that and that the youth kind of reads that more than the literature that his own society is creating. And I think that's just very interesting looking at our own very globalized world and and where cultural content is coming from. And I do think that is slightly changing, especially for Thinking back to the last book I just talked about, you know, for example, the impact of Korea's music, but also Korean films, things like Bollywood, Nollywood, there it's it's slowly broadening. But if you think if I think back at least to my own youth and the impact that British and American culture had on me growing up in mainland Europe, I could kind of relate to 
some of the things that Katie Martin was saying there. Also just the way she builds up those places, how um, thought through it all is, the way things work, the way some things do not work, and the fact that people are aware that they're an issue. Some of the technologies that she works with, the characters that she's building up. I got very fond of Mahit, but also of the characters surrounding her. It was just a really good science fiction book. And it's a, it's a thick one. It's almost 500 pages, but it's absolutely excellent. And I cannot wait to read the second book in this duology, which is called A Desolation Called Peace. So if you're into science fiction, and if you like your science fiction with some political intrigue, A Memory Called Empire is absolutely for you. After diving into a different planetary system, a different galaxy, I decided to take it straight back home to our own planet and to the own crises that we are having, specifically climate. And I read The Fish by Joanne Stubbs. I'd meant to read this book ages ago and I finally got around to it. And The Fish follows three different characters. The, the one that is really fleshed out the most is Kathy, who lives on the coast in Cornwall with her wife, Effie. And Effie is, I think, something like a marine biologist or something. But Kathy and Effie are very happily married, even though they are aware that living on the coast, which is already kind of threatened and affected by climate change, because this book takes place, I think, a little bit in the future, like not insanely far, but a bit to the extent where climate change has already had drastic effects on coastal communities. So they're kind of living there and they're quite happy until suddenly the fish come on land <laughs> and you just see fish kind of wandering around for a little bit and that is weird. So that's a main storyline. The second storyline follows Ricky and his friend Kyle. They live in New Zealand. They are teenage boys. I think they're in their final years of high school. They're young, they're trying to figure out what their place in the world is, they're dealing with some family stuff. And mainly I think their storyline is also there to show us like what does the youth do? How do they react to this changing world when they haven't even started fully properly building their lives yet? How do they cope with the awareness that something bad is happening? And then our third storyline focuses on Margaret, who is an American expat who lives in Kuala Lumpur. Her husband has a well-paying job there and she kind of fills her time with missionary work. And for her also, the appearances of the fish really calls a crisis of faith when she no longer quite knows what her place in the world is, what is going on, how this could happen, how they could have let it happen, etc. So those three storylines, we kind of hop between them. We'll have a chapter on Kathy, then a chapter on Ricky, then one on Margaret, and then we'll go back to Kathy, etc. The three storylines are kind of first set up so we get to know these people and then across the world a global storm breaks out and that's when weird things with the fish start happening once the storm passes. So we kind of move not necessarily moment by moment, there are some jumps in time, but basically we kind of follow what happens uh, to each of these three. I think Joanne Stubbs did a really good job with Kathy's storyline. Kathy felt very real to me. I had a real sense of what was going on with her, how she was being affected and why she was being affected in that way by these fish walking. Ricky and Kyle were a little bit less interesting to me, but I thought that their kind of youth, like I said, brought up interesting themes of how does the youth in engage with something like this. And I'll fully admit Margaret's storyline was not for me. <laughs> this is absolutely a personal thing, but having lived in Asia myself and having some experience with the expat communities there, um, missionary kind of work <laughs> gives me the ick a little bit. <laughs> so um, I just, I wasn't overly fond of Margaret as a character and, and yeah, um, I could kind of take or leave her storyline. And it also just, Margaret, Ricky and Kyle were not as worked out as Kathy was. So part of me was like, Joanne Stubbs could have just stuck with Kathy's storyline, although I appreciate the extra information you get through the back and forth. Yeah, so The Fish is definitely part of kind of this new genre that's developing called climate fiction, which is a mix between some speculative and sci-fi elements, but focusing very much on, on climate change and on climate science. And I think that's very important to have more cli-fi, as they call it. 
Um, I would say that the fish is more on the cozy side. If you're looking for a kind of a hard hitting book that's not going to pull its punches when it comes to climate change, the fish is not necessarily it. I think the fish is a book that's more about human beings thinking about what their responses will be, how it will affect them emotionally and psychologically when the world starts changing. You're not necessarily going to get what you see, for example, in John Wyndham's The Kraken Wakes, right? When um, when there's like warfare with a fish or or just millions of people dying. That's That's not what the fish is. Joanne Stubbs is writing much more of a psychological book in that sense. So it wasn't my favorite, but I was intrigued by it. This is also Joanne Stubbs' debut novel. And considering that, I thought it was done very well. I think um, once she kind of figures out how to balance her attention between different characters, that all of them are equally fleshed out. And then I'll absolutely look forward to reading another book by her. So that was The Fish. Next, um, I had a friend who lent me two books. The first of which was Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, which is an absolute classic of 20th century literature, of LGBTQIA literature. And I'd been wanting to read it for a while. And when she lent me a copy, I was like, perfect. So I started this um, at the airport, <laughs> flying back home and read it throughout the plane, read it on the bus from the airport back to my house and and finished it before I got home. Um, it's not a big book, it's like 150 pages, but it's intense, my God. Giovanni's Room is about a young American man called David. He now lives in Paris. He's in the middle of his 20s, roughly. And as we meet him on the first page, he's drinking heavily and he's about to have the worst night of his life because come morning, his lover is going to die. And from there, so basically the actual time that passes in the novel is just a night as David kind of drinks his way through and reflects. But as he reflects, we get these very active flashbacks to his youth in New York, him discovering for the first time that he might be gay. I'm not sure if he's gay or bisexual, but I think he's gay and dealing with the fact that he is a homosexual, that this is still illegal in the US and therefore him fleeing to France where he finds a community which on the one hand he is very eager for but on the other hand because although homosexuality wasn't illegal in France it is still kind of of course frowned upon because this takes place in the mid 20th century. So David himself is very torn. On the one hand he, he looks down upon the people he's with uh, and on the other hand, he has an understanding that their life has been shaped by living in the shadows and having to hide. And there is quite a bit of self-loathing in David, which I think is very difficult to read, but so necessary. So as David is in Paris, he makes a, a friend, a female friend, Hella, who he proposes to. But as she kind of travels around Spain trying to figure out if she wants to marry him, he meets an Italian man, also in Paris, called Giovanni. And it is... He basically falls in love, not instantly, but but hesitantly and fearfully, but fully with Giovanni. And that love is reciprocated as well. And the two of them start living in Giovanni's room, where the title comes from. And they have this very passionate love that is also a bit codependent. And, well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but something fractures. And that's how we get to... The beginning of the novel where David is somewhere else drinking while something bad is going to happen to Giovanni. And I read this in the Penguin's like Great Loves um, collection, which like it absolutely is true. This is a novel about love, um, but it's 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 I I struggle calling it romantic because it's so much about the cost of love as well and of the cost of trying to love who you love. And and it's not necessarily going to give you warm, fuzzy feelings like you might hope. Um, it's, a, it's a very insightful book. I think it's very important to read it, especially if you are part of the LGBTQIA community yourself or if you're interested in what experiences were like in previous centuries. Because the way in which James Baldwin 
depicts the way David is torn, right? Where on the one hand, all he wants to do is love who he loves, and yet he is so affected by his society's rejection of homosexuality that that he's constantly kind of hating himself, hating those around him, and the room becomes a depiction of this. So the room that he and Giovanni are staying in, on the one hand, they want to make it a little paradise, and it's like their hideaway, and on the other hand, the walls are always closing in. They cannot get out of it, and it becomes like a jail as well. And it's something where David has to decide, is he willing to stay within these four walls, or does he want something else? Mm hmm? It broke my heart, this book. It's a, it's a classic for a reason. It is beautifully written. And it's also one of those classics that I don't think is intimidating. Um, the writing is, is beautiful and it does a lot of very interesting things, but it is absolutely approachable. It's definitely something you can step into if you haven't read a lot of classics or if you're a little bit intimidated by it. So I would wholeheartedly recommend Giovanni's Room. Just prepare for painful feelings. <laughs> After that, I decided to go on a bit of a fantasy binge. And the first book I read is one that I've been wanting to read for ages. That was really a theme this month. I finally managed to get around to some books that I've been dying to read. And I'm gonna keep this one short because the book was fine, but nothing very special. And that was Three Dark Crowns by Kendar Blake. So Three Dark Crowns takes place on an island called Fenburn where a set of triplets are always born to the queen. These are three queens, they all possess a certain kind of magic, and once the triplets are born, the old queen abdicates and leaves, and then these three young queens are raised until I think they hit like 16 or 18, and then they have to battle it out between them, and the survivor becomes the queen until she herself gives birth to triplets. So this royal line is kind of favored by the goddess, which is why they always have triplets, and it's this continuing tradition. And we follow this generation's triplets. There's Mirabella, Arsinoe, and Catherine. And what disappointed me about Three Dark Crowns is that we don't get the whole story. <laughs> I appreciate it's a series. There's a lot of books in this series, but I wanted to know what was going to happen. So the whole idea is that these three queens go through different kind of rituals and then begins the year in which they have to battle it out and I thought that's what we were going to get but we've only gone through the rituals in this book. It's, this book is almost 400 pages and we get their preparations for the rituals and we get the first few of the rituals and then just as they are about to have to battle it out or as they are about to gear up for doing that, the novel stops. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I would only start Three Dark Crowns if you're willing to commit to an entire series of multiple hundreds of pages. But it was interesting. So I like the different characters. It's definitely a young adult fantasy. And I've become a bit too old for that, maybe. I did like the three sisters. I thought each of their characters was was worked out well, but Kendra Blake jumps quite heavily. So they they evolve quite quickly. We get kind of straightforward insights into into their emotions and there's not a whole lot of puzzling it out. But it was fine. Uh, I'm not mad at it, <laughs> uh, but I'm also not necessarily in love with it, which is what I've been hoping. Speaking of hoping, um, my friend who lent me Giovanni's Room also lent me Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yeros. This is a book that obviously I'd seen online. I'm part of some book communities, mainly the book blogging community. I'm not necessarily on TikTok or Bookstagram, etc. But, but I had not been able to escape the buzz around Fourth Wing. And basically, Fourth Wing is... Well, I want to call it young adult, but the sex is quite explicit. So technically, I guess it's new adult, maybe. A new adult fantasy in which a young woman, I think she's like 20, Violet uh, has to enter uh, a war academy. And she was going to anyway, but she wanted to enter into the kind of training to become a scribe, which is like a historian. But because her mom is a very famous general, her mom is like, no, you're entering the Dragon Riders Quadrant and you will not dishonor this family. 
The thing is, Violet has something of a disability. It's not necessarily named explicitly, but while pregnant with her, her mum had a fever. And so Violet has always been quite fragile, her bones and her tendons, etc. So um, she's not physically strong, she's quite brittle. And, and this is given a good spotlight, I guess, in the book. I can't personally say if it's good disability rep. I felt like sometimes it was emphasized and at other times things would happen where I was like, wait, can she do that? But it is good to see a main character who is not you know, a badass <laughs> warrior within 10 minutes. Like, no, Violet has to adjust and the world around her has to adjust to her needs as well. And I do like that that takes place in the book. Anyway, Violet enters the Dragon Riders Quadrant at the War Academy. And against the odds, she somehow manages to survive the first few days. And of course, there is a love interest. And of course, there is another love interest who is much more interesting. And... In the background, there are rebellions, revolutions, uh, conflicts, political intrigues, etc. But most importantly, there are dragons. And I'm so here for dragons, which is why I did make it through this book of 528 pages. I liked Fourth Wing. Uh, I'm not mad about it, but I'm also not mad at it. And this is definitely what they call a romanticy. So a romance set in a fantasy world. For readers like myself who like fantasy and sci-fi for the world building, for the potential intrigue, for the details, I think we're going to have to wait for the next few books for that. Fourth Wing is very um, romance based, but it was fun. It was fine. This is a harmless book in the sense that it is not badly written. It is not necessarily well structured or or excellent. It's not um, a fantasy which blew my socks off. It's not the kind of book that reinvents the genre, but it does exactly what it tells you it will do, which is it gives you dragons, it gives you a young woman trying to figure out how to survive, and it gives you romance. And I do adore the dragons. I do have to give that to Rebecca Yeros. I love the dragons. So yeah, I will be reading the next one, which I think is called Iron Flame because my friend lent it to me. <laughs> um, but that one is a chunker as well. It's a, it's a very big book, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's like over 600 pages. So that's going to take some time. But that was Fourth Wing. Now I know what the fuzz is about. And you know, it was fine. After this is a book which is more than fine. This was also a book I'd been wanting to read for a while, but had never gotten around to. And then I saw that obviously it had an audiobook, and I was like, great, this is what I am doing. And this is I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Harpman. It was originally published in French as Moi qui n'ai pas connu les hommes. And it's a science fiction slash dystopian novel. It is about a young girl who is the 40th of 40 women who are being kept in an underground bunker. And the other 39 women are older. She herself is still a young teenager, she thinks. She has no idea how old she is or what her name is. And, and they have no idea why they're being kept in this bunker. They've already been there for years. And our narrator, basically, who remains unnamed because she doesn't know her name, is trying to, well, she's growing up, but she's so far removed from any human experience, right? Because she's just in this bunker and there's men patrolling around. They'll give them food every day. They'll wake them up. They'll turn on the lights. They'll turn off the lights. And they're just watched the whole time, but there isn't, there's nothing that they're doing. And so her life is very limited, but then something happens and they have the potential chance to escape or to try and figure out what is happening in this world, why they were locked up. And I don't really want to say any more about it, about the plot at least. That is because I think it's best to just go in with that, with the knowledge that these women are kept underground, they don't know why. This novel really hit me in a way. It's, it's a fascinating take on, on gender and on what happens when when really you have no contact with the other gender which created the binary you're you're dealing with right so it addresses that in part like what is a woman when when she does not know men um what are women amongst themselves what kind of dynamics build up there what happens when you don't have knowledge of a world everyone else does 
And I can't really explain what this book did to me except that I was absolutely gripped by it. And I thought that it was beautiful um, and really well done. After I listened to the story, I listened to the introduction as well. It's always best, in my opinion, to do the introduction after you've read the book, because quite often the introduction will spoil what's going to happen. And in that introduction, um, I found out that Jacqueline Hartman is Belgian, but that her father was a Dutch-born Jew, and that they actually had to flee during the Second World War. And, and that kind of gave me an extra an extra way of interpreting the novel of of taking the horror of what happened during the Second World War and the dehumanization that so many different groups of people went through. That just just it added an extra nuance to the book. And I can just I can only say that it is worth reading and listening to and that it's it's a book to give yourself to fully and to just let whatever impacts you impact you. Um yeah, it was just really good. That's I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. It's a solid recommendation. <laughs> and that brings us to the end. This is a super long episode. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> I read a lot. That's 10 books. Um, and they were all amazing. There's some connecting themes from fantasy to sci-fi to dystopia uh, and to classics. But yeah, it was a good month and it felt really good to just dive back into literature. If you read anything exciting, if you've read any of the books that I talked about today, if you want to join the discourse on Fourth Wing, feel free to do so in the comments. I always love hearing your opinions. And that's it for today. If you have questions, thoughts on the book, or recommendations or requests for future episodes, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at bookcentralpod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. You can also subscribe to be informed when new episodes drop. You can find references to the materials used today in the description. Book Central is written and produced by me, and our music is by Scott Buckley. Thank you for joining me today on the International Express to Book Central.